Om Shanti, warm greetings. Good morning and welcome back. I'd like to take a great uh, couple of minutes for a draw for Madhavan. Om Shanti.
Welcome back. Today, we had some really helpful uh, structures to reflect on the subject. Um, I just want to check, by the way, translation is fine. Uh, maybe some might need to just unmute from Stephen. Um, we had the analogies of the, the donkey that is uh, representing a body consciousness, that state and the ego representing soul consciousness and uh, exploring on this there can be like happiness at the donkey level I think it was called a club so that is happening but the independence of the ego and his life from everything of the the donkey experience is completely separate and um I really like the reminder to start with the timeless scene that we don't start with the donkey and try to improve and evolve and become the eagle, but start with the eagle, start with the angelic soul. And from there, it is that consciousness that is experiencing the physical world and coming into karma. And another structure which was nice that we are seeing others as the brother soul from the same home and the analogy of seeing a close relative if we were to see uh, sitting on the bus and that would be like a precious moment, a passing moment if someone very close to you is there for a few minutes, but the same at another level that we are all these very close, loving souls in the same family coming here for a very short time. And that was the invitation to experiment with. And um, yes, the congruency of that space, the actions from there will help our progress if it's coming from that um, ego space. So I found it helpful also listening to today's reading, thinking about with these very clear imagery. So happy to hear your reflections and questions and meanwhile welcoming Brother Prashant Om Shanti. Hello and uh, good morning. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for quickly summarizing um, what we discussed yesterday. <clears throat> and now let us create a few more minutes of experience. Our game is very, very simple. We start with full light. Since darkness is a problem, we, we don't operate in darkness, we go for full light. And in full light, we are able to see the story for what it is. In darkness, it had become our world. In full light, we are seeing it's fictional. It uh, repeats and but in afternoon, it is fiction. And that there is the real world beyond it. When we use the word paras, paras gives us permission to see it in 100% clarity. So we are seeing the real world. And in the real world, there is the real family. They all look like tiny points. But at this level, that is normal and appears just right. It is not a gross. They are all noble. They are immortal. They are desireless and sorrowless. 
ravanless. That's right, they are divine beings. Here is the family and the father. And this environment, alakic environment, favors the soul. So you are creating full light and paras and this environment, alakic environment, it is in this environment that the soul wakes up. And we use the word invisible player. It's an important milestone. He understands his complete independence from the story. He finds it absurd to create any kind of bondages in that temporary story. Even children don't create attachments in a story. In bondages, he has, the, he has no expectations, no desires. He understands his independence, whether that story is there or not there. It is not an issue for, for the invisible player. His world is different, alokic and eternal. His family, father, home, everything is independent and eternal. Invisible player, for him, that is normal. To be immortal is normal. To belong to this supreme sky is normal. To belong to this immensely noble and uh, lovely family, that is normal. This region, auspicious region, a region of joy and love, that appears normal. For him, this is not a meditation experience. That is his life. To belong to God and to be loved by God, to have company of God, appears normal. Invisible player himself is free from this Ravan department. Ravan is in that story. More you create bondage, there is a story, there is Ravan there. Invisible player is far away from that. That's why there is silent worthiness. He feels worthy to be with God and be loved by God. It appears very natural. This has always been, always will be. No one can change anything. Invisible player says this. Soul says it. As we continue on our journey, we remember this extraordinary truth about journey in the sky, journey on the earth, journey in the story world. But the truth is the same. We don't need to be in the soul world all the time, but we are aware of this truth, invisible players will play, will come to the play field 
invisible players are also the invisible travelers. But they, are, they remain aware of the truth, extraordinary truth, aware of where they belong. That is, they stay in that wisdom and full light. Thank you. I'll come to this, uh, our uh, reference yesterday, and uh, I know some questions. What does the donkey mean? And uh, what does the prince mean? It is some questions uh, come. Eagle and uh, donkey story. So let me come to a simple image. So let us see what has happened to all of all these invisible players. They are invisible princes. When we are using the word soul, they are soul, soul means they are eternal princes. They belong to the king of kings and they are immortal. They are divine beings. The world is good for them, life is good. And what happens as the darkness comes, there is a havoc. Hmm? That is what we mentioned yesterday. Darkness of ignorance creates havoc. So if you are to see today's world and come to some diagnosis, you have to tell what has happened to this, to this world. The first thing that the expert will tell, there is a darkness, darkness of ignorance, which means there's confusion. Ask a hundred people. We said all our princes, all are loved by God. They are all divine beings. Ask hundred people, what is, uh, if they are experiencing all this? And no, so if that reality exists and they are not even aware of it, there is a big confusion. In this extreme confusion, they have created attachments and bondages. This uh, whole physical world, we said it is fictional world. It's always a gift. If you are told, let us go to watch a film or let us watch a drama, it is a gift. It is not a problem. But if you go there and create, get trapped there, then that is another story. So in confusion, you get trapped in this fictional world, the bondages. But not many people talk about bondages. They don't say, I'm trapped, I'm trapped. What does that mean? If you meet 100 people, do they tell you that I am trapped, I'm in bondage? Maybe a few, a few husbands might say something like this. <laughs> but uh, if you talk about, talk to some people, how many people will tell you that they are really in a bondage? of this drama. They are caught in the web. How many people will tell you? It's seen as natural. <clears throat> yes. It's normalized, isn't it? <clears throat> and uh, another comment, don't realize. Yes. Reason. And the reason is they are unconscious. Say that someone has a head injury, he is taken to the hospital. First sign of the head injury is there is confusion. And that's some functioning is not working internally, there is confusion. If the injury is getting worse inside, 
then confusion gets worse. And, and the next step is he becomes unconscious. So early stage, there's, at least he is responding to something that is better, unconscious, it is worse. So also here, this darkness of ignorance, ignorance, it doesn't remain academic. This invisible prince becomes unconscious. That's why there is knowledge. One important step is the soul becoming conscious. So there is unconscious, but no one appears to be unconscious. There is a full, everyone is busy. So how do you explain this? So the soul is unconscious, but when the soul is unconscious, his enemy, that is the ego, he has become the master. Ego, Ravan with ten heads, he has become the master. He rules the life. Enemy is ruling the mind and ruling the life. Fully, the hundred percent. It is say a kingdom of some country is taken over by some gangsters of some kind, and they are in charge. And then they may be gangsters, but they can rule the country, you know. And uh, and then they may have their own priorities, what they want to do with your resources. So here, the ego has become the enemy. What is, what is the problem if ego becomes the enemy, ego becomes the king, ego be, rules your life? Where is the problem? Tell me two words and that, that is an issue and that's why we have to do something about this. We call him enemy, but it is really the, it's the ego. You know, the real prince has become unconscious. Prince, in this case, means the soul. We said he is the eternal prince, belongs to the king of kings. That's what we said just now. So here is the prince. He belongs to the king of kings. His life is of joy and uh, love, and that is his family. And uh, his world is of immortality. Alokik, you know and uh, no one can harm him, such is his life. But right now, he is not conscious. There's a confusion, darkness of ignorance, darkness increases, in a gradual darkness increases. Just like say in your country today, if there is midday, then gradually darkness is increasing, darkness is increasing. And suddenly then sunset happens. Same here, darkness of ignorance comes in. And in the darkness, he creates bondages, gets trapped. In the beginning, he might say, oh, I want mukti, I want this separation, I want freedom. But then he's unconscious. And the enemy then takes over. Enemy is the ego. So where is the problem? Ego is ruling the life. Everything is going okay. There are nice elections and uh, people are happy. You know, they are planning their Christmas. So where is, what is the reason? Tell me two reasons why you feel ego is your enemy. So many might say ego is good for us also. A little bit of ego is good, some might say to you. Sorry. Um, because it promotes body consciousness, which then blocks soul consciousness, because it's based on a world that's impermanent and uh, sorrow comes as a consequence and uh, ego is attached to the temporary. Sure. Okay. You know, one reason we, we are cautious about ego, ego is a product, embodiment of ignorance. Embodiment, you know, he's absolutely, 
he doesn't see the story as story you know he sees story is his world uh, this is a definite quality of the ego ego will not see cinderella world as a cinderella world he says that is his world this is my house this is my uh, auntie and this is my uncle this is cinderella is me so he is embodiment of ignorance full 100% ignorance you, if you remove ignorance then ego disappears ego can live only with ignorance and second ego is embodiment of bondage he is trapped if he is thinking i am cinderella you know you are taking caution not even to create a some preference or expectation in a story and he is living in the story that is what it means when we use the word identities false identities ego that's what we mean you are into the story completely and when you are into such a bondage what happens you can't prevent sorrow take sorrow give sorrow becomes the life you are so insecure you are absolutely a victim you feel you are a victim because the story is changing and he doesn't realize he is in a confusion ignorance you know in in the psychology in the, there is one condition called neurosis he says i got a problem he goes to the doctor another problem called psychosis he doesn't go to the doctor he says i have no problem you know so here ego doesn't know that he has a problem ego has ignorance of ignorance it is like a there are more serious problem <clears throat> but sorrow comes he is not trying to remove any ignorance but in that inner position sorrow comes and sorrow gets worse he blames others but and that ends up giving sorrow to others take sorrow give sorrow as ego gets bigger all these departments of sorrow increases demons are created just because of this darkness of ignorance taking sorrow giving sorrow this is what we call demonic no one is bad all are we are calling we are talking here angelic princes their life is of love they don't need a workshop on love their natural nature is a region of love everyone is lovely worthy of love and everyone it is not uh, in i n h some are loving or you know but they are hating someone else but in this uh, their nature is love but when we are into this uh, darkness of ignorance creates havoc it creates demons it creates victims it creates beggars so the huge chaos you know it becomes a society full of beggars beggar mindset victim mindset orphan mindset and demonic mindset just because of ignorance so if an expert comes and sees what is happening to this planet say president biden asks you know i want to know what is happening on this planet and he calls the expert the expert will give this report that uh, there is full ignorance and everyone is in bondage <laughs> including him <laughs> and sooner or later they will take sorrow give sorrow that is going to increase and and that is going in the direction of demonic tendencies so now we understand what has happened so we said in you know, the first step was confusion
they create bondage. The soul is unconscious. Prince is unconscious and there is the enemy. And so this is what we have to address. This is the situation we are addressing. That's why we are here. <clears throat> Where do you start? The starting position has to be with the, with the light. In darkness, there is no answer to this. That is why we use this language. Paris, bring full light, full truth, you know, like our subject today also, true, true love. You know, and so truth means, you know, you are seeing in full clarity. You are going to lose it. It is not that you read the Murli in the morning and the rest of the day you are in light. No, this is the game minute to minute. Sometimes one question that came, how can I maintain this through the day when I'm doing shopping, when I am dealing with different people, you know, some good people, bad people? How can I manage this? Answer to this is creating minutes and minutes, many times in a day. Just to get this right structures through the day. One minute, but during this minute, come 400%. Get the hundred percent light. See fully, understand what it means, and bring yourself to the level of full clarity. And uh, what we practiced right at the beginning today, you will have the recording of it. Come back to that. Let the invisible prince become conscious, and he is seeing things. He knows he is independent from the story. He is independent from Prashant. Prashant is part of that temporary story. That complete independence, if it is experienced, then it is soul consciousness. If it is mixed, it is not soul consciousness. So when we use this uh, language of, uh, of the eagle, and uh, donkey, you know, understand the story was eagle gets into confusion, starts creating bondages in the, on the earth. You know, and then eagle thinks it is the donkey. The eagle becomes unconscious. And that is when ego takes over. Ego says, I'm a nice donkey. I am a donkey with a smart nose, quite happy. Ego is happy, you know, that everyone praising the donkey. And that's, so it is the, it is the analogy to, to show what has happened to the soul. It, because the ego is operating with that, I, 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 that language, it is ordinarily difficult for people to come out of this. They have become so settled in the donkey club. They want to improve the life of the donkey. It's completely forgotten that there is an eagle here. That is what we mean by ignorance of ignorance. You know, so there is no concept. No one wants to know about the eagle. No one wants to know about the uh, sky, they are all settled in the world of the donkey. Only when sorrow comes, they are questioning. Otherwise, they are very settled. And our intervention here is getting the eagle back into the sky. You are a friend of the eagles. You know that everyone is from the sky. And they all have to wake up. And within that is the answer. We'll create 
five minutes for any comments, questions, and then we'll come to the slides today. <laughs> if we miss the chance, then we won't get a chance again. Yeah. Donkeys carry loads, it's just typed, so true, and also rolls in the dirt. Um, can there be a condition called psychoneurosis in which a patient knows, so called knows he has an issue and does not go to the doctor and then he and that he can manage it? Is the question clear? Yeah, and I'm not going too much into the medical side. That was just an example I gave. And yes, all kinds of conditions. But that was just an example. Um, there aren't really any other questions. Uh, yeah, sure. So we will go to the slides and uh, we will be discussing in this uh, and the subject of love. And uh, let us try. Can you all see this many faces of love? Yes. That's it, just, yeah. Perfect, it's working well, yeah. So you will be seeing many faces of love and let us see. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, but we can't see. So we are seeing these principles, principles behind love. First principle, we can only experience our own love, which means I can only experience my own mind. I cannot experience someone else's mind. As an, as an example, there may be 50 people loving you in your town. It is good for them because they are all loving you so much, it doesn't mean you are experiencing it in your home. No, you experience what is happening in your mind. So we experience our own love. If you love 50 people, that is good for you because then you know, others, whether the others experience it or not, you are experiencing it. You experience your mind. Absolute condition to, to emerge the feelings of love, you have to be secure. This happens everywhere. And you, if someone makes you feel insecure, your love will become less. So anytime there is a experience of love, you feel safe in the presence of that person. And if the other person may trick you, may deceive you, harm you, then your love will become less. Sense of security is necessary. It is a necessary foundation to experience love.
And so it can happen. More a person has got ego and more person is trapped in that story, unpredictable story. His insecurity, you can't uh, solve it. And the demon means he, he feels very paranoid and very insecure. And then you can't solve it. It is a, then love becomes less and less. He can't genuinely love. Pretense of love is not love. And I think there are lots of songs are going on and people can be talking about love and so many cards and gifts. We are not talking about that. The feeling of love in your heart that you, you can do that only if you are very secure, fully secure. Who can ever be secure? Invisible prince, because he's free from the story, independent from the story. That's why he is absolutely secure. Story cannot harm him even the slightest. This has to be underlined and experienced. We need to, for one minute, come to this realization. So this moment in the story, someone may be really planning some conspiracy against you. Someone is trying to beat some things. There are many things are going on. Someone has done something wrong. But when the invisible prince is conscious, he realizes it is all a joke. It is all happening in the Cinderella world. And the invisible prince is totally beyond. It is like a joke to feel the, the insecure because of that is another joke. It is just like children to get frightened watching a cartoon, you know, something happening in cartoon. It becomes another joke to see children you know, hiding behind another chair. Then there are two kinds of love. One is in clarity, in the light and in the darkness. In darkness, that love, is all, that sort is, we hear all these songs that we hear in the Iron Age, they can only be the songs in darkness. So what happens in this love in the, we'll see the, the contrast between love and dependency. In other words, that word attachment, attachment that gets used everywhere. You know, that word attachment means uh, the dependency. Emotional dependency, then we use the word attachment for it. But uh, I uh, to try to avoid that word as far as possible. And the word dependency is better. So here, what is shown in the red, uh, in let us say, in a, in a I give an example. You know, person um, and, and the mother and the son. I give this example: mother and the son. Son wants to go to another country, and mother says, "No, don't go. I love you so much." It might spoil your future, but that's okay. But I love you also, stay here. So this is what the background story is. So what is happening there? Mother loves the son, they agreed. Mother does love the son. But along with mother's love for the son, there is another department. And that is department of dependency. Mother has become dependent on the son. So love for the sun is shown by this red, red um, box. And then 
that her dependency is shown in, in blue color. Now, as time progresses, the dependency has increased. And the love is still there, but dependency has increased. And now the mother, son says, I'm going to some other country. Now this department of dependency, that has got nothing to do with love. It is totally self-centered, me, me, me. As was said, once we are in that spiral, downward spiral, confusion and attachments and dependency and uh, ego, ego is embodiment of dependency as we saw. So when that happens, this uh, whole thing, now he's saying, what will happen to me if you go? He's not talking about love there. So this mother, she's thinking about me. I will feel lonely, I will be unhappy. And she takes decisions which may be non-loving decisions. She tells the son, no, you don't go. So your future may be spoiled, but that's okay. Stay here. It will be good for me. In some places, the people may harm another person. You know, uh, sometimes you know, in the name of honor or something, they can't end up committing crime. And they still talk about love, you know, and what is happening is such confusion. Love is there, but this department of dependency has come. And that's when we use the language of, of um, attachment. So each time you hear this word attachment used in the, in the context, you know, here uh, in, uh, in Murli's or translation, understand it with that meaning of dependency. So this uh, uh, dependency department leads to dysfunctional relationships. It becomes selfish and something funny in the whole thing. It is sick in the name is love, love, but it is something wrong at a deep level. Helplessly, you know, intention may be good, but uh, when there is this blanket of confusion, it ends up in a dysfunctional way. So how, what is the answer? We have to become free from these dependencies. Any relationship, I gave one example, but all our relationships have got both these factors. Best relationships, and I'm talking here in INH, age, best relationship, husband, wife, mother, son, friend, friend, you know, every relationship there is the factor of love and dependency. And we will be better if we were to be free from dependency. How, how can we be free? You know, we need light of truth. In the darkness, there uh, this all grows, you know, all these complications flourish in darkness. We saw, you know, the confusion increases, bondages increase, and uh, ego increase. And they, they are embodiment of bondages. So you can't fight this in darkness. In light, you see, this is a fiction. You are creating all these bondages. Even you are talking about love, love for Cinderella, and you are completely ignoring the real people, the real actors. This has to be realized. Here also we are seeing this uh, love department of love in the ego-based love. It is shown here in blue, and uh, and we are seeing this ten heads of Ravan. They they flourish only in ignorance, and they all are talking about love. But they got each head has got a full agenda. As long as you give him what he wants, then he loves. 
he, he believes he genuinely loves you but it is 100% conditional upon getting what he wants so if he wants cakes and you give him cake he loves you you stop giving cake then love also stops you take his cake and he will take you to court it is and then he is singing song when the, he is getting cakes he is singing songs so that is that is the love we know of and of all this love that exist that is the love we know so if there is something called true love there is also something called false love also as we said it is dysfunctional and it is sick the whole thing is sick sometimes it is better to step out of it then then it is not going to change into true love false love and false love if you are encouraging it that that will make just uh, people sometimes say fake it until you make it but when you fake it you become better at faking and you be, you think that you are making it but you are in a wrong direction there if you want to make it the foundation has to be in truth that this is what we are emphasizing here all along <clears throat> so it is like a dr jackil and mr hyde within us all this ego and ravan it is shown as representing mr hyde <coughs> so the lives becomes false but society becomes false and uh, and anything that is false sooner or later it uh, collapses you can't build a building on a false foundation weak foundation so these are some of the things we we have discussed i want to come to another subject and this is the subject of displaced love i'll tell a story that may help us understand this <laughs> the story is about one man in cambridge his name is derrick the people involved you know they tell me this story the derrick uh, he works for the foreign office he, he was like a ambassador kind of job uh, during his active days and uh, then he has a dog dog loves him and uh, when the when derek is in bathroom dog goes sits outside the bathroom staring at the door when derek is in the bedroom dog goes sits outside the bedroom staring at the door you know wherever dog wherever derek goes the, the dog is following the dog wants to know where derek is and he can't stay very very far away from derek so no doubt the dog loves derek anyone loves you like this and <laughs> loves you so much now as per said derek Uh, travels in a day that he goes to some other country sometimes week or longer and when derek is away dog is without derek so what does he do he carries the shoe of derek and protects that shoe as if it is derek what his emotion for derek same gets displaced to the shoe He carries the shoe, keeps it wherever he is going, and protects it. He is staring at the shoe, you know. And until the Derek comes back, then he is not interested in the shoe. And then he go found Derek again. 
So we call this a case of displaced love. You know, it has shifted from Derek to the show. Does it happen in human beings? Do you know anyone? Example of displaced love? Do you know anyone in your life? In your town, anyone exhibiting displaced love? You can answer. Um, yes, and one example is photos that can be kind of kept and uh, the memories of a person, maybe if they've passed on. Yes, that's true. Yeah, you, you will see it in many cases, you know, people think souvenirs and keep some memor memoranda and they think that it is extension of the person and uh, transfer their emotions to that. And uh, they buy things. Uh, someone wrote paper sometimes or some musical instrument from the person. And they, they transfer those feelings to it. But also here, cryogenic, someone's typed, when they freeze the body to preserve it. Uh, that is, uh, they themselves might uh, choose that. That is another uh, thing. But I'm going to finish this um, uh, this presentation. Like, uh, come back to the whiteboard, if that is okay. You still need to press the um, red button, I think. Yes. Someone has written, we transfer our love to the donkey. Yes, yes. So here I'm uh, showing another case of displaced love. And let us let us try to get that right. So we said our starting position is here is the prince, invisible prince. He is loved by King of Kings. He belongs to that world. He needs nothing from anywhere. He is beyond harm. He's secure totally. And he is full 100% light, 100% clarity. That, that, that's why he's free from ego and Ravan. That department is not there in him. There is a story here, and uh, that's a nice story. That's great. You know, but he has, he, he's not creating any bondage in that story. Story start, story finishes, great, that's good. But he knows of his very special invisible brothers. This love for the brothers, as we said, they all are childlike, in an absolute childlike state, with zero Ravan, zero ego, zero sorrow, zero desires, zero ignorance. They all are innocent, harmless, selfless. And at the same time, they are in wisdom. They are not just uh, silly. They can create problems to you by mistake. No, they are into full wisdom. They are sensible. And at the same time, they are clean and innocent and harmless, authentic. Such is the story with each and everyone. All are like this. And we said yesterday, it goes beyond the human clan. All souls, human souls, animal souls, all are lovely and worthy of love. So this um, invisible prince has this full experience of love in a, a region of love. 
you know, God loves, that is one thing, but everyone is loving and lovely. So this is his experience. Great. Now what happens? He comes in the physical world. That is not a problem. You may be loving a friend. You go in the town center. You are not sitting with your friend, but you go to the town center. Doesn't mean that you your love for your friend finishes. No, love continues. You are just meeting some people. You may go to watch a theater, you know, some drama. That is also a nice extra gift. You and your relationship, friend and love, that continues. But then what happens? Darkness comes in, ignorance comes in, bondage comes in, you know, that is happening now ego and there comes a time you cross this line and what happens when you cross the line the dotted line of ignorance now you can't see the world of the eagles anymore you are you are into the donkey world you can't see that sky you can't see the subtle souls anymore. You are into the story. Crossing the line means you are so much in the invisible, that is so much into the visible, so much into gross. In other words, you cannot see Derek anymore. You know, the Derek is there, but your sight, your spiritual sight is gone. You are not Paris. And um, you, are, you are caught with the Pathar intellect and with the ego. You are caught in the story. You can see the shoe, but you cannot see Derek. In this case, Derek is there, you know, in other words, the soul is there, but you cannot see him because you don't have the Paris intellect. You don't have the sight. So what can you do now? Just like the dog, you know, he gets attached to the shoe in the same way these invisible princes now They have come here, but they are now creating bondages, attachments to the show in this in this world, in the story world. They are creating songs for the show. So which means, you know, here show or the, we use the word donkey in, instead of eagle, which means body and the role that has become your, your object of love. It's a case of displaced love. When Baba uh, uh, speaks Murli, Baba qualifies, starts right from the first sentence, Atma. Baba is speaking to you, the soul. You may be Brahmin Atma, but Atma, that word is emphasized almost many times in every Murli. So he loves, he sees you, the Atma. He sees the eagle, he loves the eagle. He acknowledges your existence. He respects the eagle. He serves the eagle, he wants the eagle to fly. That is very different to the language that someone loves the donkey and serves the donkey, want to see the donkey happy. It is not the same thing. Now and then you might use the language, soul, 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 but your vision is at a donkey level. Your positioning is at a donkey level. 
that is case of displaced love. You want to say anything? Do you know anyone who is experiencing this displaced love? Loving donkey and completely ignoring eagle. Do you know anyone? So nice to have the setting of cleanliness and uh, souls and their perfection. I think only then can you understand what has happened and the extent of the problem. Somehow it might be hard to grasp how we have displaced the love until we have really grasped the, the starting point, if that makes sense. So because everything has become so normal in body consciousness, we have to um, really work at the, uh, what does it mean? What does it look like, this clean, innocent, harmless, lovely? Um, then you realize how much power is there and how complicated it is when we've, when we've lost the, the, the reference point. There aren't any other questions, just agreement. Uh, ah, here's one question. Oh, well, first comment, all humanity is working at donkey level. Um, here, should you help an elderly relation with detachment to reduce dependency? A good question. Um, in it, our whole, by both these questions, our all of humanity is at a donkey level agreed and even our you know sanskaras are at that level in the midst of this we have to create one minute of full light and true love and uh, just experiencing know what what that that is and uh, and uh, just like Baba, he says, I am serving the souls. I'm not serving your ego. I'm here, I am here to remove your ego. I'm a friend of the soul. It is very radical to be friend of the donkey and a friend of the eagle. These are very different things. So most people in this world, they are all friends of the donkeys. And they are enemies of the eagle because they completely ignore the eagle. They don't even see the eagle. They themselves have crossed the line in that confusion, and that's why that is what is happening. Baba has said this sometimes, you know, that you are enemies of each other, helplessly, because in that confusion, you, you are helping the enemies of others. You know, and when you are helping enemy of others, you are creating problem to the eagles. So the game here for you, one minute, come into full light. Don't be happy with uh, 50% or 90%. And since you are choosing what, just one minute, do it for, uh, go for 100%. And 100%, there will be no mixture. You are not saying oh, there's Atma, Atma, and you are talking about donkey. That will not happen. You know, you will you will be understanding the reality of, of these invisible brothers, their greatness. And that genuinely there will be benefit if they wake up. That is the only um, benefit for them. Anything else, it is it's waste and will bring penalty. More we are working in ignorance, it brings penalties. So you, you are creating that one minute. You are, I'm using the language one minute, but it is like a step. One minute is a start. It makes the para stronger. But our aim is to make that natural nature for us. 
Start with one minute, one minute of the right direction. Sort of the question about should you help elderly relation with attachment to reduce dependency? We can't really uh, help anyone if, uh, like that, but uh, but we can bring knowledge. We can see them with um, with the uh, uh, truth. If they don't even have knowledge, they will not just become free from attachments or detachment. But if you have the intention, that is good enough. But let us apply that in ourselves and that will help others to some level. It's like we've spent our whole lives in, in um in confusion, building attachments. It just looks more absurd later in life, but if that's the programming. Um, but to, yeah, to be an inspiration and give a different perspective and reaction can be really helpful for someone to realize there are other options and maybe come to their own realization. There aren't any other questions and um, it may be a good time to come to the rooms, but if you have anything you'd like to share at this point. No, this is uh, very good. We'll go to the rooms and uh, we got a chance to see the subject of love from different angles. And uh, What would the question be that you'd like to bring? You know, to understand the difference between false love and true love, they, what, how will it present? How will it be experienced? That is the most important thing for us. Mm. So just to mention after rooms, uh, all being well, we'll be joined by Brother Charlie in Australia. Um, so, Pop the discussion question to begin uh, in the chat, and um, we've made it so you can change the room if you need to. And we'll meet back in uh, just over 10 minutes. I'm shifting. Welcome back. Bentornati. Paula just needs to click, perfect. <laughs> so let's just create like half a minute to, to come to some um, contrast, some experience based on all that is shared. And then we'll come back. you and um, I'm really uh, happy to have this opportunity to wish good evening to Charlie who's joining us from Australia I believe Sydney um, Charlie's um, coordinating activities of Brahma Kumaris, um down under and just for Charlie's benefit the discussion in the last half an hour or hour has been on true love as opposed to false love, what does it mean? And phenomena of displaced love 
the example of a dog that starts to worship the shoes when the owner is gone and how we are doing the same thing, displacing the love between souls. So um, we have this opportunity to hear from you on a subject that I believe is um, the one that um, perhaps is closest <laughs> to the heart. <laughs> Uh, we hear and so it's really special that you could join us for this retreat and uh, also for everyone if you have a question or comment from uh, that you'd like to share based on what Charlie speaks then do feel free to put it in the chat so good evening and uh, a warm welcome thank you. thank you so much Sarah lovely to be with you and um Thank you also, Prashant. Lovely to see you as well. So thanks again for having me. <clears throat> You're in the morning and I'm just about towards bedtime. <laughs> um, you know, it is true that this subject is closest to my heart because I think that what has really sustained me on my journey has been, you know, I would say the experience of uh, true love. And <clears throat> I have a memory of being with Daddy Janky um, in a meeting, actually. And there was a small group of people there, and she just stopped. I think everyone knows Daddy Janky, who was the head of the Brahma Kumaris till just a couple of years ago when she passed away at 104. And her eyes became like little light bulbs of love. And through her eyes, she shared this extraordinary quality of love that just, you know how that love can just shift an atmosphere. It was so beautiful. And after quite a long time, she stopped and she said, it's love that makes me move. It's love that makes me tireless. It's love that's taken me beyond all the obstacles in my life. It's love that's taken me beyond all my limits. You know how we confine ourselves to this sort of very limited self-identity in a sense. <clears throat> and I remember she was just saying, learn how to draw this true love from Baba, from God. And really, I think this life of this spiritual life is this beautiful life of constant learning about the self. And when I observe my inner world and how I work, in my experience, that when my heart is full of that quality of love, the quality of God's love, a purity of love, that I notice my whole inner world is different. I feel very easy about myself, very accepting. I would say there's a sense of contentment and my attitude towards others absolutely shifts. It's a palpable shift. I'm much more compassionate and understanding and forgiving towards others. And then on the other hand, sometimes I've observed that when <clears throat> the heart lacks love, the mind can never stop. It's like, the, it's like there's an agitation inside something is missing, something, sometimes we have everything, but something is missing. I often feel the first need in life is love, the first desire is love. And if that's not fulfilled, a million other desires seem to be emerging. You know, the desire for acknowledgement, the desire for respect, the, the need to be noticed, and a whole lot of other stuff kicks in when that first and most essential need isn't fulfilled. And I have a very dear friend <clears throat> here in Sydney who's an um, oncologist, actually, and a palliative care physician. And he was telling me once he went to a workshop with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, whom I think many of you do know, and it was about grief. She ran these workshops about grief. And during this workshop, a whole lot of grief came in him about the loss of a little sister. Um, his little sister died in, of cot death when he was 10 years old. 
And he was explaining how he went through so much upheaval internally. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came over to him and listened to the whole story. Very, very sweetly, he said, very patiently. And once he'd expressed what was inside, she said, actually, that's not the original grief. The original grief in the human soul is that I, I lost perfect love. I disconnected from this divine love, from this true love. And I think that it's true that sometimes we have losses in our life and it seems to open a deep wound inside us. And to me, I think the greatest sorrow in the human soul is this, this loss or this loss of access to this divine love, this pure love, this perfect love. And when I began my spiritual journey, I have a very clear memory. You know, we all have that, <clears throat> that beginning point where I was just trying to sort things out inside my head. And especially I had been on a whole journey wandering around the world for a few years, living in religious communities. And um, I was just trying to develop a connection with God. And I can remember clearly walking down the street in London, actually, thinking so deeply about Baba and really who is Baba and this relationship, this connection. And it's almost like there was a pause button on time and I felt absolutely love to the core of my being. It's hard to put into words that it was a love that just went to the essence of who I was. And I felt this, this feeling was so incredibly beautiful. And the only thought I had was I've come home. This is actually what I was looking for. And I think this is really what the human soul searches for, a sense of connection that's permanent, a sense of belonging that's permanent. And sometimes I feel, you know, what is meditation? We can give a very technical explanation. But ultimately, to me, I think it's becoming soul conscious, letting go all the temporary self and becoming that seed and sitting in front of God, sitting in front of the ocean of love and allowing myself to be completely loved. It's like the whole inner world cools down, becomes still. Such a sweet experience. And, <clears throat> you know, what is knowledge then? Knowledge is then seeing what is blocking that love. Because sometimes we sit in front of this love, we have an intellectual belief that this is real, you know, this is the love I've looked for. But sometimes I can't taste it, I can't feel it. And I think this flushes out probably the, the biggest challenge on the spiritual journey is to deal with this sense of unworthiness, this sense of inferiority, this sense of, you know, not being good enough that has been so deeply entrenched in the psyche of the soul in my search for my truth. And to me, you know, if I don't taste that love, don't panic, <clears throat> but just gently, you know, each time I sit, become the child, sit in front of the ocean of love. And the more I taste that love, it converts into spiritual power. It's an extraordinary inner power that I gain. And I love the concept here I am talking about love. <laughs> I love the concept that the cycle is a love story. The cycle is a love story. The golden age is actually a world of love. Just get your head around the idea that there's no duality. Imagine living in an environment, there's no concept of like and dislike, accept, reject, which every millisecond of life we're dealing with. And I think because it's in our memory track. We have experienced this. It's why we're so idealistic about relationship and love, because we have known such a quality of love. But as we journey around the cycle and we come to the Copper Age, it's not that we stop loving. We just begin to love the wrong things. When I love my own body, it becomes ego. When I love the bodies of others, it becomes lust and attachment. 
when I love material things, it becomes greed. In a sense, all the, the vices in the soul, the pollution in the human spirit come from perverted love or misunderstood love. And I feel, in a sense, this spiritual life, one way of understanding it, at least for me, is that Baba really comes to teach us how to love accurately once again. And I remember once Baba defined true love as loving that which always exists. This is incredibly profound and deep, that true love is to love that which is permanent, eternal, which always exists. And this whole education, in a sense, we all know that when I attach my heart to anyone or anything temporary, we know we build fear, we build insecurity into our lives. And so this extraordinary education we are given at this time is to, in a sense, refocus our love from temporary to eternal, from physical to spiritual, from love based on emotion to love based on truth. You know that love based on emotion is that very fickle love that loves you one day and can't stand the sight of you the next day. But love based on truth, it's like we have this idea of a loving intellect. And this is love based on understanding. This is the love that will love you in a good mood and will love you when you're not feeling so good. This is the love that sees your beauty and fixes its vision on your beauty. And even if you fluctuate or go through ups and downs, that this love is permanent. This is true love. And even I would say from dependent love to pure love, it's this extraordinary education of refocusing my understanding of what love is and how to love. This is like the learning we receive at this time. And in a sense, sometimes I think all I have to do is love that which always exists and I will become pure. I will really clear my account and become a pure soul. When I love God as a soul, when I love myself as a soul, and when I love others as souls, that is laying a foundation on that which always exists. And so I'm building true love back into my life. And in a sense, this body conscious ego, which all of us grapple with on this journey, is really a pollute, it's a pollution in the soul as we know. And what is the role of ego? Ultimately for me, the role of ego is it makes me feel separate. It tells me, and it's so powerful in my head, that I don't belong, I'm different. People don't want me. It not only makes me feel separate from others, it makes me feel separate from my authentic and true self. It makes me feel separate from God. And I feel it makes me feel separate from truth as well. And so the more you know, I become soul conscious, in a sense, I'm stepping back into the world of true love. Anyway, I'm going to put a pause button on myself. <laughs> and because uh, Sarah was telling me just a few minutes and maybe we can have a few questions and chat. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and it's really kind of complementing what was um, discussed earlier. I was just thinking in my mind while we wait for some questions to come, do we have to go through a period of like they call cold turkeys, like the withdrawal symptoms of this false love, which is like attachment and um, we have to untangle ourselves because Shant was saying earlier, the world is in falsehood, but also our own sanskars um, have been programmed from the last half cycle before we're able to really, maybe there are things in parallel, but how do you see that transition? Because my concern sometimes is that they don't get mixed up 
that we, we want to be really clear that the love for what is permanent, as you said, is really definitely for what is permanent and not a little bit mixed with the wrong things, the role, the body, etc. I hope the question. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I totally agree, Sarah, that um, the cold turkey does happen because, um, you know, sometimes I feel there's three sources of love in life. There's, you know, my family, friends, others. There's love from myself, secondly, and love from God, thirdly. And I think, you know, love for myself, that's probably the hardest thing most of us find. It's the biggest challenge in life. Love from God. I think a lot of people have faith in God. And, um, but to really have an intimate experience of love and belonging, I don't think many have that. So my one source of love is really others. And that's been such a deep programming in my psyche that it's other people who are going to fulfill what I need in life. And so my whole mindset is extrovert looking for others. And sometimes I feel that the mind is like a vacuum cleaner, you know, that <clears throat> if you give me love, you know, I suck it in. If you give me respect, I suck it in. But if you give me, ins if you insult me, I take in that. I, you crit I take in absolutely everything because the programming, the great myth, is that love is found externally. And it is the, to the transitioning of really understanding how to absorb God's love. And, um, and then actually the wonder is that of that is I become naturally detached and I can really love others as I really feel I would like, you know, like to love others. It's a natural byproduct of loving God and this relationship with God. Yeah, very nice to, um, it's, it's always simple, isn't it? The concept, but the reprogramming, um, uh, it, it's good that it's simple because we can come back again and again. Uh, one question that's come up around relationship with others, how can I accept that my 85, your old mother is still authoritative to me at age 65. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are both widows. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think, what do they say? Your parents are always your parents, no matter what age you are. And, you know, I would say, and I, you know, I think Prashant, who's taught all over the world, would agree that I find that the the number one question that almost all people have is dealing with difficult people, especially close relationships. I think that's the main question that is asked in all spiritual forums because that's where the heart gets hurt most and we take so much sorrow. And this is why I think, you know, true love also brings out a detachment as well. And this word detachment is the most misunderstood word of all because it, in English, I think it, make, it sort of makes you feel it, it has this part of aloofness and non-caring. But to me, detachment is to be, not to be influenced. And I think it's an absolutely essential requirement in relationships that when I have a deep relationship with God I'm absorbed in God I feel less influence by those around me so that I can sustain goodwill and love for them rather than falling into the patterns of give and take of sorrow with others and I I would say for me on my journey that um, the more I felt close to God the more I feel detached in a sweet way, if I can say, then I can maintain loving feelings for those who are close to me, but their difficult behavior doesn't affect me so much. Otherwise, so much of my mental energy goes into trying to sort out my feelings about difficult people and their behaviors and their attitudes. And uh, 
you know, sometimes people go on their whole lifetime having waste thoughts about others. We have to do something. We can't change them. I can only change my response to them. And this is a huge truth on the spiritual journey. I hope that helps. It's, it would be nice if you want to follow that up in the chat, but it, it's like clear for all relationships. Um, so this connection with God is like um, question, he, he has this unconditional love. So the more we attune to that, then it will, it will kind of protect us from all these other feelings. Um, could you, anything you want to say about that? Um, it's, it's connection with mercy and benevolence. Is it connected to his unconditional love? And, and how is it he has unconditional love? Well, probably, maybe it just leads on from what we're talking about, that God is has unconditional love. And most remember God is the most loving of all, but God is also the most detached of all. And that enables him to be able to offer this love constantly, uh, this unconditional love, because he's not influenced by our behaviors. Whereas in our relationships with others, we're influenced by them. We can't have this unconditional love. And yet my own experience is that when I have the capacity to be loving to people around me, even knowing their weaknesses and their, and their behaviors and their attitudes, deep down, you know it's right. You, you really feel comfortable with yourself, I think, when you can express love for others. And I, I think God's capacity to be unconditional in love is because God is completely and utterly uninfluenced, is beyond influence. That's purity is about influence. God is eternally pure, is never influenced. We lose our purity, and so everything impinges on us and affects us. And the spiritual journey is, in a sense, healing me of all the things that influence me, the the habitual patterns of absorbing from others and then being disturbed, affected, upset, etc. There's no doubt it's a big journey. <laughs> but I, you know, if I look at my life, I'm still influenced by some things, but far less than I used to be. Far less. I, and even if something does influence me, I bounce back much quicker. And so I think it's an, it's an incredibly you know, wonderful, beneficial part of the spiritual journey that you come out of this addiction to sort of taking sorrow, being hurt, being influenced by those around you. Yeah, and that brings back a sense of, I guess, self-respect when we feel that in ourselves. Um, Prashant, did you like to share anything or have any comments or questions? Hi, Charlie. Hi, Prashant. Lovely to see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is actually midday here by now, you know, so <laughs> it is not bad. Uh, the time difference is not so bad. One question I had uh, in connection with difficult people. Um, do we should we experience love? from difficult people. Should we experience love from difficult people? Yeah, are they loving at the same time whilst they are difficult? I think so, sometimes they can be. I think people, we all have our idiosyncrasies, don't we? And, um, you know, I think, where are we going on this journey? Where does it lead us to? And I have a memory once of, um, you know, having the thought, what is perfection? I mean, what does it really mean in a tangible, real way? And once Baba said that perfection is to have loving feelings for everyone. And in a way, I think that when I can live in this world with all the personalities 
and I can maintain um, loving feelings and receive loving feelings like you were just indicating. It's a sign, you know, really of where, this, where I've reached and that, you know, my mental accounts with people are finishing in that sense. So I think it is possible. I think it is possible. And I, I feel when my attitude is benevolent and loving, it brings people feel that and they respond. It's like a blessing from the hearts of even a difficult person. I feel when my mind is so strong with love, I can shift the responses in others from maybe something negative into something more loving as well. So yeah, I do think it's possible. What do you feel? <laughs> 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 yes, you know, I totally agree. <clears throat> they are uh, also, you know, innately loving, and uh, and just that we have to learn how to tune into that uh, to to get our uh, receptor tuned in to the right frequency. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's they, lovely. They are our teachers, and there's always love for a teacher. So they are giving us a good lesson. <laughs> no, I heard one say um, a guru had an ashram actually in, in, in uh, Europe, and there was someone working in the kitchen who was incredibly difficult, and no one could work with that person. And they left, and the guru invited them back. And it caused uproar in the ashram, you know, that people felt happy that this person had gone. And the, they said, how on earth could you invite this difficult person back? And the guru said, well, he's your main teacher. He's a better teacher than me. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we need a lot of um, understanding to think in that way. <laughs> yeah. it's so true isn't it it's like a real test because otherwise um from the ego perspective i'd much rather someone be pleasant and polite to this this role than not and that really shows the the extent the ego is there but if if there is that um equal uh, no matter what the role is then one is really come come beyond the the physical and into the unlimited then that that is the true love so it it's quite confrontational but yeah. <laughs> yes so um we have come to time it's gone very fast when we're talking about these sub subjects of um very interest but if there's anything final you wish to share and then um, any any words of meditation um, to go more into the experience would be great. But just before that, I will mention um, we have a retreat. Um, the next advanced retreat will be in three weeks and it will be a slightly later time. So if you're in the wrong time zone, you can always get the recording uh, register. We will send it to you. Uh, on the sacrificial fire so to burn the old sun scars to experience this uh, truth and we'll be sending an email to you with the information and um, yes when someone's typed in the chat no friends no enemies only teachers very nice <laughs> so, good. <clears throat> so uh, handing back to to charlie and um you missed to hear the meditation and any final thoughts. First of all, thank you so much, Prashant and Sarah. And just for a couple of minutes, <clears throat> let us sit quietly, put down devices, etc. And let me become soul conscious and feel yourself sitting so lightly in the forehead. 
has become lighter and lighter. And in this sweet place of self-awareness, become like a small child and sit in front of the light of God, a radiant jewel of divine love. I don't just have faith that God is the ocean of love. Allow yourself to feel the vibrations of the highest quality of love I can experience. Just visualize the form of God and these vibrations entering the core of your being, washing you, soothing you, healing you, and absolutely loving and accepting you. The more I feel this divine love, my self-respect is restored and my inner power returns. Om Shanti. Even though this session is closed, there's no reason to stop the practice. <laughs> Goes beyond the limited. Thank you. I also want to thank the translators for the incognito um, service and co-hosting team and everyone on the call for creating time and sharing your presence and questions and comments. If you want to come into camera, give a wave. Lovely to see you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Prashant Bhai. Thanks, everybody. See Thank you me. again. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Om Shanti. Goodbye. Om Shanti. Goodbye. Good night. <laughs>